My name is Marnie Scott and I'm a specialist with the Jackson County Missouri Children's Division and today I'm going to be talking with you about guidelines for mandated reporters of child abuse and neglect. Um, I've been with the Children's Division for about 17 years and um, I've been there that long because I really believe in our mission of protecting children and strengthening families. So I'm really honored to have this time with you to be able to talk a little bit about our agency and um, hopefully be able to partner with you and um, just to make everyone more comfortable in understanding kind of their requirements when it comes to reporting child abuse and neglect. You should have in front of you some um, PowerPoint slides on, some, on a sheet of paper. I'm gonna go through those um, and then as I understand it, you'll have an opportunity to speak with someone at the end of this presentation um, if you have any questions. So um, I'll just get started. The first slide you have is the reporting requirements under Missouri law, and as you're going to see, there is a whole list of names of professionals um, there in front of you that are considered mandated reporters. Among them, of course, are teachers. Um, but to just put it in very simple terms, anybody that has responsibility for the care of children is considered a mandated reporter, if that's in a professional capacity. Um, so that is kind of what you need to know there. You don't need to know the whole list of people, but anybody that's responsible for the care of children in a professional capacity is considered mandated under the law in Missouri. Um, the other piece of the law that you wanna pay attention to is that, that piece that says reasonable cause to suspect. What that means essentially is you don't have to be certain that a child has been abused or neglected. What you need to have is just a reason to believe that could happen soon or has happened. So if you have any question, if you're not sure, the most important thing to remember is please just call us. Call the hotline. We're gonna be getting to that phone number here in a little while, but um, if nothing else comes from this today, I hope that what you'll remember from this is that if you, there's ever a question at all, you don't need to understand all the requirements, you just need to call our hotline and those people will walk you through and they'll make the determination as to whether or not the requirements have been met in order for us to investigate or assess further. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, it kind of goes a little bit more into the reasonable cause and that just means you don't have to have the conclusive proof, just reason um, to suspect or believe that child abuse or neglect may have occurred or could occur. Um, you also may make a report to a law enforcement agency, and in some situations that may be important to do, um, but that does not negate the need to contact our agency to make a report. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, the next slide is another piece of the law which basically states that mandated reporters cannot make reports anonymously to us. It's very important that we're able to speak with you and find out as much information as we can from you. Since you probably have a relationship of some sort with the child, maybe even the family, it's just going to be very important for us to be able to interact with you and, and speak to you to find out what you know. Um, our hotline does take anonymous reports, but as a mandated reporter, you are required to provide us with your contact information. Keep in mind that information is never ch shared with the child or with the family that is subject to the um, report. So you don't have to be concerned that we're going to reveal to anybody that you called to let us know about your concerns. Um, just being perfectly honest, sometimes families figure out or assume correctly uh, who made reports just based on the information provided. Um, so that may happen and you may have parents reacting angrily to that. Just know that regardless of what they say, we are not confirming to them in any way who's making the report to us. If they're saying they're angry, they're probably just making a correct assumption and that does happen. 
So moving on, some things that are kind of important to understand, and pardon me for looking down, but I don't have this memorized, so I'm going to have to read this from my slide. Um, abuse is defined as any physical injury, sexual abuse, or emotional abuse inflicted on a child other than by accidental means by those responsible for the child's care, custody, and control, except that discipline administered in a calm and reasonable manner shall not be construed as abuse. Um, Sometimes that's tricky for us to determine what's um, a reasonable amount of discipline, um, but typically we look for things like the age of the child, um, were there injuries as a result, was it excessive, was it some sort of bizarre punishment, that sort of thing. Um, but again, that's something that we will decide. If you feel like something occurred and you believe it was um, abusive, please call us. Um, neglect is defined as failure to provide by those responsible for the care, custody, and control of the child, the proper or necessary support, education as required by law, nutrition, or medical surger, surgical, excuse me, or any other care necessary for the child's well-being. So basically, the big difference is in abuse, it's an act toward the child, and neglect, it's a failure to provide something to the child. It's an act of omission rather than commission. So that's one easy way to remember that. And then another important part of this that I mentioned in both those definitions is care, custody, and control. In order for um, an act to be considered child abuse under Missouri statute, uh, the person that inflicted the abuse has to be responsible for the child's care, custody, and control. And it says that those um, include the parents but are not limited to those. It could be the guardian or any other person that has exercised supervision of that child during a 24-hour period. Um, and in addition, it would include anyone that has access to the child due to the relationship with the parents or family. So that can entail a lot of different people. But typically, it would not include another child. There can be exceptions to that, but more often than not, um, another child abusing a child would not fall into this category. Um, next is just the reporting procedure, and it's got our hotline number. That's 1-800-392-3738. Um, when you call, you'll just identify yourself, and they will walk you through the process. Um, they are trained at the hotline to get as much information as they can to make those determinations. And so, um, once again, if you're not sure, please just call, and they will um, definitely walk you through that um, to make those decisions. Um, some of the main things they need to determine in deciding if they're going to take a report is, is the child a child? Is it someone who's under the age of 18? Um, whether or not the person who alleged the abuse had the care, custody, and control, as we previously discussed, and whether or not those earlier definitions of abuse or neglect were met. Um, in addition, they're going to want to know, did the incident occur in Missouri and or does the child reside in Missouri? One of those has to be met in order for Missouri to conduct the investigation. And um, we want as much identifying information as possible um, regarding the child and the family. The next three slides are, contain quite a bit of information and this is really an ideal for us. Um, so please don't be overwhelmed by the number of bullet points you're seeing there. We don't have to have each and every one of these fulfilled in order for you to contact us to make a report. Um, but the main idea is as much of this as you can provide us, the better. The more quickly we can respond, we can conduct background checks and find out as much preliminarily before going out to meet with the family as possible. But mostly um, the main thing is we just want to know the who, what, when, where, and how. Um, who is the child? Can we get as much information on birth dates and um, names and so forth? Same with the parents. Siblings in the home, we need that information. What happened? What, what do you know? What, what's the story, essentially? Did the child report this to you? Or are you just seeing something that you're of con you know, that's of concern to you? Um, why are you suspecting that child abuse or neglect has occurred? Uh, when did this occur? And when did it come to your attention? Um, it's important that when something comes to your attention, you report it as quickly as possible. Um, hotline is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So especially in cases where we're uncertain about child safety or there may be injuries that we want to be able to document, please call us as quickly as you can so that we can respond more quickly. Um, 
if you maintain files in your school um, pertaining to the students, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and grab that file and have it in front of you, um, just so you have all that identifying information handy when you make the call to the hotline. Um, and then we're going to want to know where is this child? Where is the child now? Is the child at school? Has the child returned home? And we're going to want to assess the immediate danger level to that child. Um, we're not going to ask you to tell us if the child is safe, but we're going to want to know if there are things that um, cause an immediate threat to the child's safety. Um, if that's the case, um, we would be required to respond within three hours. Um, if, and that would involve situations where there's maybe a very serious injury to a child, if there was some kind of bizarre punishment going on, if there's a young child who may be supervised home alone without food right at this moment, or um, uh, anything with sexual abuse and the alleged perpetrator remains in the home. Those are all going to get a three-hour response from our agency. Um, understand that whenever you call the hotline, you're calling Jefferson City and um, then from there the alert goes out to the local county we have to get that printed and so there's going to be a little bit of a lag in time before we actually have the report in front of us and have an opportunity to read it and look through it um, if you feel like this child is in serious danger right in this moment please call 911 police have a much greater ability to respond immediately but again that doesn't mean don't call us call 911 and then call us and we'll be um, responding as quickly as we possibly can but just some people um, expect us to be there immediately and just understand there might be a slight delay just for technical reasons um, let's see if the child if the call is accepted as a child abuse or neglect report um, typically we respond within 24 hours unless it meets the criteria that I just discussed um, if the only concern is educational neglect of the child and there are no other reported concerns, then we have 72 hours to respond. If you have questions about the response level of the report, ask CRU, um, I'm sorry, the hotline, CRU is what we refer to it as, um, but call the, or ask the hotline worker that you're speaking to and they can tell you um, what the response level should be from our agency so you'll know what to expect. Um, Okay, moving on to the, to the next slide, I'm now on the one entitled Protective Custody. Um, just to clear up, there are very common misconceptions sometimes, even amongst professionals, that the Children's Division can take custody of a child, and we do not have the legal authority to do that. Only juvenile officers, police officers, or a physician can take emergency protective custody of a child. So um, if that happens, if the Children's Division is requesting that, we have to make a referral to court with our recommendations, but ultimately they make the decision. Um, in cases where we do take protective custody, we do physically go out and do the removal of the child, but in the company of law enforcement who has to serve that court order. So just to make sure that everybody understands that, that's one of those common misconceptions that we get a lot of questions around. Um, okay. So, once the report does hit our office, what you can expect is a call back from the worker that's being assigned the report. Um, and so again, your contact information is important so that we can call you and um, just speak directly to you to make sure that we understand the information that was taken by the hotline, that we got it all correct, um, maybe you've obtained additional information since the call was taken, and just to have that opportunity to interact face-to-face. Um, we're required to make that. Typically, that's going to be the first contact we make. Um, but if we can't get a hold of you for whatever reason, we will go ahead and initiate the investigation. We're not going to wait until we hear back from you. Um, but if you get a message from the worker, please call us back. We really just want to talk and find out what you know and make sure that we have all the information correct. Um, let's see. Also, we're going to be contacting the school district liaison. And Dr. Dan Peters, as I understand it, has been designated as the liaison for you. Um, and so we will be notifying him of the initial report and of the outcome of that report. Um, so that's just the basic information that we will share. But the school liaison is also a multidisciplinary team member. Um, so if additional information 
is, is needed with regard to how we're coming along in the investigation, that is the person that can contact us and we will share what we're able to share. Um, we have to respect confidentiality, but we also want to be working together as a team to make sure this child is protected and safe and that we're providing all the services that we possibly can for the family. Um, and again, just to reiterate, the name of the reporter is never going to be revealed. So um, you don't have to be concerned about us revealing that information. Um, and then the last slide I have here is just with regard to immunity. Um, there is no legal penalty for making a report that's made to us in good faith. There's not going to be any legal ramification for you. If you make a report to us and we go out and it turns out it was a mistake or it wasn't true, no, that's, that's fine. If you're making the report in good faith, we're going to go out and check it out and hopefully we find that it's not true. Um, but there is no legal penalty to you, no repercussions for you for making that report to us in good faith. On the other hand, knowledge of abuse or neglect by a mandated reporter can result in some legal action against you. So um, it's always better to err on the side of caution if you have reason to believe or knowledge of if a child tells you about some abuse or you become aware of it, please call and tell us. Um, it's always better to cause upset to a family, um, ruffle some feathers a little bit to make sure a child is safe than to not go and have a child be left unsafe. So um, err on the side of caution always. Call us and let us know what you know and we're going to go out and check it out. Um, so yeah, and just in conclusion, the, the outcomes are much worse if we are not notified than if we are. So please, as mandated reporters, make sure you give us a call and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Valenti. I'm a member of the Diocese Office of Child and Youth Protection. I'm also your ombudsman. So what does that mean? Typically an ombudsman is someone who fields complaints for an organization and acts as an impartial go-between to resolve issues. In my position for the diocese, I field and investigate allegations of sexual abuse of a minor. I also manage the process that resolves those allegations by working with law enforcement, the independent review board, the Director of the Office of Child and Youth Protection, and the Bishop. So what does this mean to you? Well, first let's talk for a moment about your responsibilities in your work with children, youth, and vulnerable adults. We all share the responsibility of protecting our children, but how do we do that? The first thing you need to do is arm yourself with knowledge. What are the warning signs of a predator? What are the visible or observable signs of abuse on a child? The second thing you need to do is be familiar with your reporting responsibilities. You need to report suspected abuse or neglect to the Missouri Child Abuse Hotline. You need to report known abuse or neglect to the police or the law enforcement agency in your jurisdiction. If you work in the school office, you should also report the suspected abuse to your supervisor or to the person in charge. When should you report the abuse to me? You should always report to the abuse to me if, number one, the abuse is sexual. Number two, it involves or involved a minor. Number three, the suspected abuser is an employee, volunteer, or clergyman of the diocese. One of the big changes made after the sexual abuse scandal hit our diocese is that the leadership wants you to be proactive in monitoring for abuse. If you see something suspicious or inappropriate, call me. I will conduct a full and fair investigation aimed at the protection of children, youth, and vulnerable adults of our diocese. You do not need to call me if the abuse is not sexual. You do not need to call me if the abuser is not a volunteer employee or clergyman of the diocese. For example, if you believe that a parent is abusing his child and he is not a volunteer, a teacher, or an employee of the diocese, you still of course have an obligation to report that abuse to the Missouri Child Abuse Hotline and to the police, but not to me. Why not? Because the process I manage is the procedure responsible for determining whether someone should volunteer work for or minister in the diocese. 
The Office of Child and Youth Protection will be working with your supervisors and pastors to develop the safest protocol to protect our children, youth, and vulnerable adults. You hold a tremendous responsibility in helping to create that safety net for our community. We're proud to be working with you and excited about the opportunity we have to make this community a safer place for our precious children. Please don't hesitate to contact me with your questions or your concerns, and certainly reports. My dedicated line is 816-812-2500. Thank you for doing your part to protect our children and vulnerable adults. Thank mm -hmm. you.